Hello and welcome to the Building Sustainability Podcast with me, Jeffrey Hart. Every fortnight, join me as I talk to designers, builders, makers, dreamers and doers. Together, we can explore the wide world of sustainability in the built environment by talking to wonderful people who are doing excellent things. Hello and a very warm welcome to episode 101. It is currently June the 27th, 2023, which happens to be my 40th birthday. As a special birthday treat for myself, I have just an incredible episode for you. This episode's guests are the wonderful Joe Bolton and Matt Whitaker of Abundant Earth. Uh, what is Abundant Earth? Uh, so taken from their website, we are a workers co-op and as a community, we work and teach on a patch of land just outside of Durham City. Our passions include organic veg growing, permaculture and crafts. So if you've ever wondered what it's like to create an intentional community from the ground up, then this is the episode for you. It was such a joy to talk with Joe and Matt. They are both incredibly lovely, delightful, humble people and also unbelievably skilled craftspeople. Uh, I have a willow backpack uh, that I got from Joe a few years back. That is one of my all-time favourite things. And I have this gorgeous pint mug from Matty uh, that he turned on the pole lathe that accompanies me everywhere I go. I've put links to their Instagram accounts in the show notes. I thoroughly recommend you go and check them out. I could go on and on about how great these two are and indeed how great everyone at Abundant Earth is. But you're going to figure that out for yourself over the next hour. Um, I should say that this is actually the first of two episodes with Joe and Matt. The next one will be out in a couple of weeks um, and has them talking about the construction of their glorious straw bale house, where this episode was recorded, in fact. Uh, before we get into the episode, time to thank new patrons if you want to support the podcast you can financially support it uh, through the patron site patreon.com forward slash building sustainability new supporters this month are tristan wooler thank you tristan alexis who has gone in at the spoon level so i will be carving a spoon for you alexis uh, i hope i'm saying your name right we've got eric weaver uh, we've got Matt Stevenson also getting himself a spoon. Matt was on the podcast at Future Build. Uh, Matt is doing really great things with timber. And uh, we've also got Benjamin Algar. So thank you so, so much to all of you, the new patrons, and of course, the existing supporters. Uh, you really do help to support the podcast, uh, no matter how much you give. And of course, all of you get yourself loads of great bonus content. So Again, if you'd like to support, then head over to patreon.com forward slash building sustainability or find a link in the show notes. Uh, I thought I would catch up on some of the reviews that have come in. Um, <laughs> how do I feel about reading this one out? Uh, you'll, I guess you'll see why I'm hesitant. Um, five stars, the best podcast around. I've never written a review for a podcast, but this one is so good that everyone should listen. Building sustainability is a gateway drug into all things sustainability, building, craft, technology, and I love the variety. Jeffrey is a font of knowledge, but, but so humble, and I want to thank him for the podcast and my beautiful handcrafted spoon. Seriously, what more could you want from a podcast? Uh, <laughs> is it the act of a humble man to read out? that <laughs> uh thank you thank you so much for that review um the reviews really do help uh get more people listening um so if you do have a chance to leave a review certainly on apple podcasts uh it's really helpful i was actually going to read out a whole bunch of these uh because i've not kept up with them but you keep saying really nice things about me personally uh so I think I'll only do one per episode. <laughs> um, what else to say? Netcom Craft School uh, ha is progressing. Uh, we have leveled the site, uh, flattened out a little spot in the woods uh, where our craft school is going to be nestled in. We've got all of the chestnut poles on site. 
And uh, we're just waiting for a little break in our schedule. And uh, myself and Mike, who you might remember from the Christmas episode, will begin framing the structure. So very excited. Um, Earth floors. I've got some really exciting earth floors lined up that I can't really talk about. But as soon as I can, I will be shouting about them because they're they're pretty exciting. Mm, I think that's about it from me. I should just get out of your ears. I will be back at the end of the podcast to remind you to share this episode with everyone you know. But until then, enjoy the delightful yet very real and honest conversation with Joe Bolton and Matt Whitaker. Uh, intentional community, I suppose it would be called. We all got together just after university years. Some mm-hmm. of us made it through university, most of them. Uh, I didn't. But we all met at that time. Did you meet at university? Uh, three of us did, and then I met Joe later on. I'd been living in a community in Spain and and moved back to this country because of some relationship issues over there <laughs> and uh yeah met matt and beth and wolf and yeah we became part of the project great mm. we were all living in cabins at that time as well outside newcastle they after the second world war they'd set up loads of these little cabins in woodlands and along sides of fields where people could escape all the devastation of the of the town i suppose mm. and nobody wanted them just rows of these cabins that were some of them falling down i think yours you got for free you had to pay two years back rent uh, i me and wilf bought one we paid i think we paid 500 pounds each which was a lot of money to us but yeah it then meant we were we had a home it was knackered it needed redoing lovely ones in the middle of the woodlands so yeah. we were all living in in those at the time um i mean they sound idyllic they're amazing. Why yeah. didn't you stay there? It's it, it's quite the ha- ah, I see. <laughs> it's rented and it's a big landowner, so you really you could only be there for part of the year, so you weren't allowed to live there. Uh-huh. Although the people that managed our site were happy for a couple of people to live there, mm-hmm. so we lived there for about six years, I think. Mm. But they're beautiful. There's some down by the river. I think there's a four or five sets of them in Northumberland. Mm. Mm-hmm. But they gave a taste of life what it what it could be like mm-hmm. if you didn't have loads of bills coming yeah. in that made you work and pay those bills all of the time and get you into this cycle of you know not having enough space to create and explore and all of that. So it was quite a, quite a moment when I discovered them. Definitely, just to have that freedom to to sit back, create, think about what you want to do. Perhaps you know that's a that end just you know five pound a year water rent it was and 200 quid a year on land rent that was it that was your bills you know? wow yeah brilliant and we built we got to build our own home mm. and have our yeah. own electricity be completely off grid experiment with building experiment with different technology in terms of power so, yeah really creative start yeah we did dream that all our friends moved into all of the cabins <laughs> and then we bought the field in the middle and made an amazing forest garden and community space. It would have been amazing. That's, that sounds <laughs> <incredible. did> like... <laughs> <laughs> mm. And it has happened a little bit, actually, down at uh, Whittle Dean, Wilf and Beth. They lived, we lived up on top in the plains, uh, up in the farmer's fields. But then if you went down into the valley, there was this place called Whittle Dean, mm. uh, which is the most beautiful old coppice oak hazel woodland from Roman times and far back beyond that, I would have thought. Uh, They live down there and just recently they've, that's been bought out from the landowners and it's now part owned by the people that live down there and part owned by the Woodland Trust. So that that kind of dream Mm. that we had of, you know, owning it and making it into a community is actually beginning 20 odd years later. <laughs> but that, that's how we started. That's we we'd all met, we'd all bought this, and we also had begun uh, to put money aside, a mm-hmm. heavy amount of ten pound a week. We'd started a group, 
fundraising, looking for land, asking people if they wanted to join, that kind of thing. So I had all these meetings where sometimes there'd be just the four or five of us. Sometimes the group would swell to 40. Crazy dynamics would go on. People would splinter off and Mm -hmm. then decide actually what they wanted, co-housing, not farming. So we had two or three years of that, didn't we? Mm. Lots of newsletters and just looking for land. Just yeah. trying to get that intentional community sorted. And developing a group of people around us. So we bought this land with completely with loans, none of our own money. So there was, we did a presentation to groups of people that wanted to support us, asking for support, financial support. Mm-hmm. And we were given, and the land cost us, what was 35 grand or something like that? 31, yeah. So we got all the money from friends. And gradually paid it back with no interest over 10 years. Wow, wonderful. Mm -hmm. And so how did you find the land? The yellow admag. A friend of ours, Leah, (laughs) found it in the yellow admag. Right. Which, for people that don't know, the yellow admag was like eBay in paper form. (laughs) They had wanted uh, and for sale sections on just about everything. Yeah. Tools, sheds, greenhouses babies, prams, clothes, land, cars. Um, yeah, and we've been looking for land for ages. We've yeah. seen loads of bits. We were out of the Tyne Valley for buying land because it's really expensive there. So we've come mm-hmm. County Durham because land was cheap. Um, there's a lot of, you know, old mining communities. Um, it was much cheaper here. So someone phoned us up, a friend, and said, oh, you should look in the back of the yellow outbag. There's a bit of land for sale. We just had our first child. Wilf and Beth actually went to see it. I'd just given birth yeah. about a day before. So Wilf and Beth went to see it and they phoned us up and said, uh, yeah, it's great. So they started the process without us even seeing it. Because wow. we had a, a criteria. It must be near town, public transport, because we yeah. wanted to do all this outreach with kids and grow vegetables, sell them and that kind of stuff. So, mm-hmm. so that's how we found it. Yeah, Brilliant. A mixture of luck and just... Keeping looking really. well, perseverance, by the sounds of it. Yeah, mm. yeah I suppose so. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so it was the two two families that two that... families and another individual, Ian, who you might have met at Northern Bowl, doing all that water. Uh, those five of us. Great. Mm. And how? Like, what? What were the aims? Like you've sort of spoken a little bit about food and outreach and things like that. We. I think we all had quite different, we were very good at drawing up a a vision of what we wanted. So we all had different visions. Um, We have a vision document even. Uh, So we we wanted to create really something different. So uh, Wilf's a permaculture teacher. So his ideas were about developing teaching and, and his design work. Uh, yes, so we did lots of different crafts. So Beth was doing some felting. We, for me, basket making, growing willow, teaching yoga. Matt was being Matt your ciders. So it was kind of wanting to be, wanting to live very closely connected to the land, be inspired by the land, uh-huh. And let it nourish and nurture us. So, so it kind of yeah, we had our kind of projects that we wanted to do, but really just be embedded. Let those projects come from from our life here, living in the woods, getting to know the place that we are. I think. Yeah, that connection to the land was definitely the base where it all sat and came from. Wanting to kind of be able to plant trees and and tend them mm-hmm. and, and eat the fruit and have our children because we had young families. I think both families had our boys were about two, one and a half, two when we moved here. Mm-hmm. So wanting to grow food to sustain our families that was connected to the earth and sensitive to the, the needs of the earth. So we have really good food, have more children experiment with living in community mm-hmm. and that side has been dramatic because our lives are in the western world we have spent so much kind of 
building walls around ourselves, being mm. individuals. And it feels like that actually the journey that we've had here, so much of it has been part of being a community, trusting, communicating, learning to communicate with each other in our families, in our couples, and as a, a, and in the wider community. Mm -hmm. So we also income share as well, which has been a huge number to grow with that grew out of... How did it come about, was the yeah. really interesting thing there, I think, wasn't it? Yeah. Shall I talk about that? Yes, now? please do. So I think we were all doing different work. So I was doing... I was the landscape architect for a while, so I was doing some design work <clears throat> in schools and I did quite a lot of Living Millow stuff. Uh, there was other... Others were doing kind of work outside of the community that generates huge, quite a lot of income. And it was in particular the sort of imbalance seemed to be, because Matt, we got lots of grants. I, I was hedge laying. You were hedge laying. On a grant, and it was 20 pence an hour at best, you know. Right. <laughs> other people were going out. We bought this land together, look after the land. Yeah. Uh, other people were going out earning 20, 30 pounds an hour. And it was the person that earned most money at the time that really came up with the idea yeah. of just pooling it. Mm. And then sharing it back out again. And there had been a bit of friction before that happened, hadn't there? It was just that, you know what money's like. It, just, yes. it twists things horribly. And, you know, despite having this idyll and everything we wanted, suddenly this pressure of money distorting everything and being an inequality is happening. And, and so by sorting it out, yeah. it immediately got rid of that. It was instant. As soon as that was decided, yes, that's what we're going to do. So all money yeah. that came into the community, because we also had young children. Mm -hmm. So some of us looking after the children, going out to work. So the imbalance that would happen in a family anyway. So it's kind of how do we expand out that self, that interdependence and also some kind of independence as well. So we, every, so everybody earns the same amount of money. It doesn't matter if you're looking after the kids at home or in a high-paid job working for some big customer. So it's all the same. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter how many hours you work either. So that developing of trust has been really important. And maintaining of it as well, because yeah. it still happens today. Yeah. And things have changed radically, you know. We're, we're no longer... Because back in the beginning, we were... We were living together. We were in yurts and geodomes. We had an outdoor kitchen and we worked on everything. You know, we, we got here, the field was just a field. There was no, no track in. There was one building that was the goat shed. That became the, the place where the, the vegetables were sorted when they were grown. You and Beth sorted out uh, the fledgling business in the garden, which is now one of the, the backbones of what we do here. Is the veg box scheme goes out every week from there. You know, so all of these things were being sorted out. We were living together, working together all the time. And it seemed perfect solution and was a perfect solution. But as we've grown 20 years later, you know, mm -hmm. there's, at the moment, there's a discussion, does this work for us still? Right. Um, because we no longer work quite with each other in the same way. You know, yeah. We've all got our little areas. And, you know, so it's still an ongoing discussion and still an important thing and, Mm. And it works, but I think, you know, it's like anything in life. It's, it, it can stay static and then all of a sudden it, it needs to change. Yeah. And you, you haven't really noticed that it needed to change. So at the moment there's a discussion and it's lively and it's hard and it's difficult at times. And we're but, really good at reaching out for help. We've got, we're part of Co-ops UK. Nice. So we've got support from Co-ops UK to some funding to receive some mentorship, some coaching in in other ways our financial model might shift and change. And some team coaching as well. And Beth has just uh, qualified as an NBC trainer. So oh, great. Nonviolent communication coming into our meetings has been incredible. Mm -hmm. So we've been on a massive journey together over 20 odd years. Uh, yeah. And still here and I think thriving. <laughs> it <laughs> seems to me. Um, can I can I ask, can I just sort of get clear in my head um, the, the the finance bit? 
So is it if you do sort of work outside, mm. that money comes into the community, into the pot, or but the then money. work you're doing on the land is paid for, so you're sort of paid out of that pot. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And you're all paid the same and it doesn't matter yeah. how much yeah. you know individuals bring. Yeah. Yeah. Both does our accounting and so different areas of the business are, are we can see which areas of the business are bringing what they're bringing in and what's going out. Mm-hmm. But it still all goes into the big umbrella. Yeah. And we receive a small income. Great. And then we've got work that is communal work, land work here, looking yeah. after the land. You know, yeah. Coppice and firewood. Uh, working on the tracks so that people can come in and out. Uh, yeah, so all of that work doesn't get any money paid from it. It right. doesn't earn any money. Yeah. Uh, so that's supported by the business and the community. And we've always homeschooled as well our kids, mostly homeschooled our kids. So that's also, you know, really wanting to support that journey as well Mm -hmm. great uh sorry i'm following a slight practicality tangent but i do want to come back to (laughs) the the sort of community um so what are the 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 avenue or the what are the incomes what are the different ways that that this place is actually so my income streams are i'm a yoga teacher uh so i do a couple of classes and i I'm also doing some training at the moment in somatic experiencing. I'm really interested in, yeah, bodies, how we work, what we hold. So that's one which is completely not land-related. And then my other is I'm a basket maker. Mm -hmm. So I teach and I am making baskets for lots of different people in lots of different ways, commissions, um, mostly commissions actually stalls fairs but mostly commissions oh and i can say so the other two streams that are coming in so beth and wealth so beth uh beth and i began the veg box scheme mm-hmm. probably about 15 18 years ago um which has developed over the years She's now, she's just stepped out of that and she's doing more of her nonviolent communication. So that's lots of different streams from there. Mm -hmm. Wilf, uh, when we had the children, Wilf came in to help in the garden. So he is now running the kind of the box scheme side of it. And we had a volunteer that came in a couple of years ago who, uh, to support some building work. So we, we are part of Woof, or were part of Woof. A work, willing workers on organic farms but we were taking volunteers for longer periods of time so the she stayed Lauren there. stayed she's been with us for four years and is now managing the garden she as Beth stepped out she took over the management of it she's doing the growing side of things <clears throat> yeah so Lauren's managing the growing Wilf is managing the book scheme itself mm. And then um, I'm green woodworking, mostly. Uh, well, not mostly, actually. A lot of green woodworking here on site, uh, coppicing, looking after the woodland, fruit trees, lots of apples last year. And then a bit of blacksmithing, lots of teaching. I've taught a lot of a lot of children over the years and worked in various places. But uh, yeah, maybe there's people that have been excluded from schools. Maybe they've got mental health problems. Um, that's dipped a little, but uh, we're getting back into that, doing stuff with uh, people just left prison, going into prison soon. That's kind of really nourishing stuff. Uh, also, blacksmithing, sawmilling, green building, uh, lots of timber frames, both here and outside, earth houses, straw bale houses. All of it really informed by what's needed to be done here and then a need to make money Mm -hmm. and take it out. People have asked for So uh, kind of chops and changes for me, really, just the ebbs and flows of what comes in and uh, what I really fancy doing as much as anything as well. But those are are the core things. Brilliant. It's really interesting the sort of mix between 
very practical things and very uh what's the word like sort of like nvc and you know it's mm. the soft skills i think they're, mm. they're called um interesting to mix the, the yeah two of those. i think as we've got older it's definitely there's been a shift <laughs> the hard physical lifestyle um I think, yeah, look, just looking slightly wider. And maybe just a different... Perce- how we perceive what's important, you know? Mm-hmm. I think the, how our community's developed and the importance of our communication has been so clear uh, that actually, yeah, the priorities may be slightly an well, age. We've though. just had this 20-year anniversary as well, haven't we? We have. And that, that I think was kind of a focal point, certainly. You know, we've got to this point where our children are, are quite old. Yeah. In that they're becoming very independent. One of our boys has left home. The other is, you know, nearly 16 and he's off doing his own stuff. Whereas the previous 20 years we've been here, is they've been very dependent on us and we've been setting up this place to live and work. Yeah. And, and be. So at this 20 years, yeah. it's been... For me, it's been very interesting just... Okay, we've done 20 years of wonderful stuff. It's been hard, it's been great. And now, actually, what do I want to do? It, we've kind of felt all four of us have just been able to sit back and think, okay, we don't just have to keep on ploughing forwards with what we're doing. It's, there's also stuff that we need to feed inside ourselves. And mm-hmm. as long as you know, it fits in with the land and doesn't, doesn't harm that in any way, it's what actually do we want to do? taking it forward, and both I think it comes, personally and, yeah, and no. community-wise. Yeah. And maybe maybe starting to look slightly wider at just wanting a better world, mm. you know, seeing the struggles that people are having. For me, that's it's my, my new training is really taking me, that's where that comes from, really wanting to be in service to the wider world rather than just our little space here. Mm-hmm. I, I had a moment when I was... Uh, out in the States and I was traveling around and learning straw bale building. And then I had this real urge to actually, I needed to make the world better, like the world that I knew that I grew up with. Uh, mm. And I needed to come home and, and actually, you know, start putting out there. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, that sharing mentality. Mm. That, you know, you found this amazing thing and it, it is making positive ripples in in society immediately around you your friends and your family and you know, being able to to offer that further mm. is giving the world an amazing an amazing thing how how can you take that to other people yeah. how can it how can it help them as well in a way you know re-enfranchising people with skills and abilities that have been lost through many of our systems that we've set up in society you know uh, for me, that was one of the things that I was heavily into when we bought this bit of land was you know, going into schools and teaching kids there uh, and seeing the design technology lab ripped out. And that for me was a very formative thing. You know, mm. I had forges. We had an old car that people could take to bits. We had, you know, clay for modelling. All of these things that were now covered in bits of health and safety tape, like do not touch, unsafe. And it, it ripped the heart out of me mm. that, you know, I was enfranchised. I was told that I was a human being that could make and do things and get in in the world. I could I could do these things by myself. And all I saw was, I mean, it wasn't totally true, but in my 20s, you know, I saw almost black and white that, that the education system was ripping that out of people. And in order to make these things, you had to go and ask someone else who had been trained properly and you were no longer able to do these things. That, that re-enfranchisement of being able to give that to the world is an important thing with whatever your passion is, whether it's somatic experience, infantry or permaculture or earth floors for yourself. Yeah. Um, I think we're going to come back to that. I'm, I'm sort of slightly wandering us all over the place. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. The We were talking about communication in in abundant earth how do you have i've written down the word which i really don't think is the right word i wrote down governance uh which mm. probably isn't <laughs> what you, 
the right the right term. But did, did you sort of set up a, a way to talk or a way to make decisions or a way to sort of communicate or an intention? Or... We didn't. <laughs> right. We didn't. And I think we were, we have, am I right in saying that? We haven't, have we? Until, until oh, we did, more we, recently. Yeah. I mean, we set up all sorts of we systems have, for land management. and We yeah. have always had a weekly meeting. Yeah. Because we found that, especially when we, when we stopped living together, so we were all living in the same house for a while, which was quite intense. But when we separated out, it became more important to to have a meeting time. Mm-hmm. So we have weekly meetings, um, and yeah, we have more recently become clearer about what to do in conflict. So mm-hmm. Beth and I have both done some conflict uh, training, mm-hmm. <clears throat> and and we're, so we are better now. I'm not mm-hmm. sure. We... There, there have been. There were, I was in my twenties when I moved here, and you know a lot of stress going on for you know trying to build somewhere to live. And there were times when you know we stood in fields shouting at each other. You know, where right. all reason just broke down, uh, and um, we didn't have any systems of how to sort that out. And until recently with especially the Joe's training and Beth's training and bringing that into the group, it has sometimes been very messy. Mm -hmm. Um, We're very good at coming back together and just saying, okay, need to come, we need to resolve this or come back and just have another conversation about it. Mm -hmm. The land is owned in trust. So we are kind of rent our little part in it to build our houses. So we're so invested in this project. Nobody's going anywhere. So we have a commitment to each other to work things through. Mm -hmm. And we're getting better at it. But we are hugely learning all the time. And we didn't have the skills to start with. Yeah. Yeah, They hadn't been taught to us. No. I, I... lived in an estate when I was a child and neighbours said hello when you passed them. That was about it. Mm -hmm. Build higher walls if you don't like the people that live next door. Yeah, it's a massive journey. Mm. And we're working on it. And the current situation is we are having help from Co-ops UK uh, funded support. Yeah. Is there anything you wish you'd done differently? We'll be back after a quick break. If you're looking for all things BMX racing, you found the right podcast. Here at Lane 8 BMX Podcast, I'll speak to the local racer, the national racer, and even the Olympic level racer. I'm talking kids to the weekend warriors and much more. So get comfortable, turn up the volume, and remember to snap on green. Hmm, interesting question, Jeffrey. In terms of anything in particular? I guess it's sort of on that, um, you know, community, organisation, communication. I think I would, I, I would have, it would have been so helpful if we'd found support earlier. Right. And really um, looked at that. Which, Just for, for getting um, an external... Yeah, voice and yeah, having a a framework to uh, to better communication, better understanding, resolve conflict. Yeah, Mm -hmm. because conflict always happens, whether it's in just a mild disagreement of uh, a way to plant cabbages or serious breakdown in trust. Sometimes, you know. Mm -hmm. Whatever the the issue is, there's there's always a bit of conflict in community, that... and but it's if you can sort it out reasonably <clears throat> without it getting toxic, then it's a lot easier to to move through. And mm-hmm. Didn't really have any of those skills. And as part of our course, it was really clear that to- uh, that conflict isn't isn't it can become toxic, yeah. but what we what we what we need to get to is the idea that it's inevitable. It's not just likely. And it's actually a great thing that happens. 
because you have inf different information coming into a situation which is really useful and really positive and good. And what we all we need to do is find understanding. Mm. So what is it that you think? Can I really hear what you're saying? Mm. Can I really understand it? And then can you really hear me and really understand me? And then we have the information. And then with that, we can forge a path forwards. But it's I think that idea that it's it's not just likely, it's inevitable. And the problems happen when we put a lid on what we think. And we all have different ways of doing it. Some of us might just put a lid on the way we think and contain ourselves. And somebody else might be really forceful and think this is... So can we allow the people that don't let their voices be heard to be really heard and and get the people that are being a bit louder and shouty to to hear more? And once that happens, once we find that ability to hear and be heard, then we're going to find a way forward. So that's been huge. That's, oh, I think that's slightly changed my world. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's good information, isn't that's it? That's really good. Yeah. yeah. Um, what, are, what are the, the sort of plans for the future of Abundant Earth? Is there, do you have, you know, goals you'd like to achieve or are you sort of happy to see it develop or? Yeah, we're definitely talking a lot about that at the moment. Mm -hmm. It does feel like we're, we're at such a point of shift. Our children at this age, our vision start to move from just treading water, just putting a roof over our heads, putting food into our mouths to, oh, what else is there? So it's all current. It's all conversation that's happening at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, so we have just got a big lot of work for probation services, which feels huge. So they we're taking in NVC, yoga for the women's group, crafts, which feels so incredible to be taking it to people that it could it could really help nourish, mm -hmm. change perspective, maybe. So that feels a really exciting way to go. This is really exciting. It's it's what we wanted at the very beginning. It's, you know, that was yeah. that was one of the main goals, just to offer a space where people come and feel safe and be held and learn if they wanted to but really just a place to to nourish people really and that nourishment often just comes from the land and being here you know people often talk about you know just sitting and hearing what's going on about them, which is mainly birds wind in the, the leaves of the tree you know it's just that quietness that enters a human when when you are just allowed to be in a place of beauty that you know, can be all around us. I mean, and that this place has been set up around that. You know, the houses have been built to encompass nature rather than eradicate it and then build on top of it. It's like be within it. So yeah, having a having a place that we can offer people that, that gives that, whether it's in the form of Northern Bowl, which is bring people in, give them crafts, or whether it's you know, there's, there's people going to, there's young kids going to come in with another groups by somebody from outside. And it's just kids that are going to be offered a nature space just to sit and nurture them. So there's, there's all sorts of ideas. And we've got the classroom at the top, the space at the top, which is being used for various groups. So somebody came to run a natural dye workshop through the week. So probably having the space used by more people, I would imagine. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, in terms of looking forward as well, one of the children, not ours, is living here in a yurt. So developing, interesting to know what um, the next generation is going to look like. Lauren mm. looks like she's here for to stay. So I don't think the community will expand any further, but certainly other people coming and doing projects here looks like more of a possibility reaping the benefits of our years of work. 
eating apples, <laughs> making fruit pies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, enjoying the space as well. You know, had a heads down for so long sometimes, you know, whether it's building a house or whether it's you know, mm. just work, mm -hmm. making it work. It's been tough at times and it feels like there's a lot of space being offered to us because by doing what we've done, we've, we've actually got some skills. I feel like I've got quite a bit to give people and I, I've never really believed it up until this point. I, I felt like an imposter. You know, I felt, you know, I've learned a lot of stuff by making a lot of mistakes and that often means that you're a failure in some people's eyes. You know, you've made a mistake there. You obviously don't know what you're doing, but actually mistakes are one of our greatest teachers, you know. It's like, it makes you really think. Sometimes it can be very hard on the soul that, you know, you've completely messed up here. And A, it might have cost you lots of money, but it's usually cost you a lot of time. Blood, sweat and tears is a real thing, you know. It's, it really hurts when you make mistakes, but actually... Those have brought us so much wisdom and knowledge that uh, they're invaluable. So getting to that point of belief, I think, is also something I feel is really important at the moment. And when you do believe in yourself, when you can offer that wholly and fully, it, it becomes this powerful thing that you've got. And, yeah, I, I'm, I'm just loving the ability to share that and to be valued for sharing that as well. This, the probation work is probably some of the best work that we've got for a long time in that we can offer it to people that are in great need. But it also it's some of the best work ever, perhaps, in how it's it's going to pay us monetarily, which usually I don't I haven't cared about. I've always found money difficult. Mm. But actually to be able to do some work, be paid for it well, and then pay that back to the community without having to break yourself. You know, your skills are valued by society, and then we can invest it in hedges, woodland, you know, whatever it is. You know, Building a workshop. Rather than having to do all of that work for no money and then do all the extra work on top of it and break yourself. Mm -hmm. so, that feels a really special place to be through mistakes and hard work and valuing oneself I suppose yeah and what you've been given so. and the breaking yourself point is interesting <laughs> because over we have all had quite big health crises over this time because it has been all consuming mm -hmm. and exhausting having small children living in a yurt with an outdoor kitchen no electric or drinking water or <laughs> anything for many years was hard and so yeah we have all have health crises in the in the time mm. so we have broken <laughs> broken and repaired and yeah yeah and that repairing is feeling very very big at the moment mm -hmm. yeah, it's wonderful at the moment a wonderful space to be in it's also been very hard just because we're readjusting our, our mm -hmm. whole community system in some ways. In other ways, it's as stable as it's ever been. But big discussions and kind of the, the looking into those things that we plastered over before. You talked about how some of us buried, you know, if we had an issue, if we did shout at each other, it was often, there wasn't the skill or the time that we've been talking to. Mm -hmm. So now, 20 years point, we have perhaps brought that back out of the dark again and it seems almost inappropriate that something from 15 years can be brought up in relation to today and it's hard for the other person to hear maybe but it's so valuable for one person to get that out and finally lay it to rest mm -hmm. and it is valuable for the person that's being told it they're not being told it in a way that's meant to punish them for what happened or you're punishing yourself by saying what you did wrong or it's just this this way of slowly healing from the inexperience that we had at the time to now, you know, the skills that we've now gathered. Uh, it feels it feels wonderful on so many levels, yeah. but still hard work. Mm. And I think within that, taking responsibility for our own journey, our own healing, 
mm-hmm. and not throwing it around to other people. Mm-hmm. And I think it, we we have it all. We're all about fifty, you know. We're we're in this <clears throat> at the point of life, of reflecting and learning and taking responsibility for ourselves. Mm. Beautiful. Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Is it possible to to find a, a sort of best best moment? Over the past 25 years, did you say? 21. 21. 22, yeah. The best moment, eh? Oh, I've got, I, I've got one. But, yeah. We got, Matt and I, we've had a, <clears throat> as we've just been talking about, there's been lots of difficulties, hardships, joys. And we got married. Uh, we've been together for 20, oh, 26, 26 years. Yeah. <laughs> 26 years next weekend. Mm-hmm. And we got married six years ago. And it was about celebrating for lots of reasons. Lots of people said, why, why now? And it was, it was about celebrating so much, like the journey that we'd had as a community, as a partnership, the two of us, and a point of really, and, and in a way, the same thing we've been talking about, the whole community, of looking back at what we've been through and then really wanting to come together to look forward and bring together all of our friends, all of our family. And we had our own cathedral, which is down in the woods here, which is this gigantic beech tree with its limbs stretched out. So that felt like such a mark of our journey together as a couple and our journey with this project. And yes, celebration of our celebration. friends and community that have been part of our lives. Giving really. thanks, it felt like a huge gratitude, and I think we called it a gratitude ceremony, didn't we? Something like that. I I might have called it that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, and Beth, because Beth also, as part of her many skills, um, is a celebrant. Right. So she was our celebrant, and yeah, mm-hmm. so that was that was that was my probably most joyful moment in the last. That was a very joyful moment. What are you going to say then? Uh, 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 <laughs> and that was yours as well, wasn't it? <laughs> Obviously, that's my joint joint number one. Yeah. If, uh, if you had to say number two, <laughs> if I had to, I would say. <laughs> uh, no, it was a very beautiful three or four days, just. Everyone that's that's helped out in community, very special. But another very special moment was um, was the raising of the first house. Oh, yeah. Yeah. See. Yeah. Still, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay that's that. good. That's really, <laughs> that's good. Uh, I mean, for we've been living in yurts and geodomes for quite a while, so we decided to put up the first house, and I had a real hankering to do a, a timber frame, which I. Never done in square timber before. So, so. oak frames, now, big, big. Timbers. It was oak, yeah. I mean, there was a woodland that's only fourteen miles away, uh, and uh, it was having its final thinning. And I got a phone call from someone saying, uh, "You should get yourself down to that woodland over there because uh, basically they're chopping down all these amazing trees. It was large, you know, large, like forty centimeters across, and oak the same, like." 40 clear feet of it wonderful stuff and they were selling it for firewood and some of it was going off down to Wales to be cut up into the internal fluting you know like you have to pulp hardwood have a mm. hardwood component for these cardboard boxes that crenellated stuff in the middle oh, right, of the two yeah, yeah. That, so that all of this wood was getting sent to, to Wales to get pulped up and all of a sudden the gas subsidy was taken off by the government and it wasn't worthwhile so mm. they were stuck with all these trees that they didn't know what to do with they didn't there was no no use for them but it turns out you can make a perfectly good timber frame out of uh, trees like that it was glorious stuff and we lived off that for many years because we bought 30 tons of oak 30 tons of larch i anyway i made the timber frame for the house mm-hmm. big heavy oak beams and it we had a raising day we had a raising weekend april the first I can't 
16 years ago. We, we just killed the pigs beforehand as well, haven't yeah, we? Yeah, so we had, yeah. We had we a, were raising pigs and sheep and chickens. and We had these huge sides of bacon. We did. So we invited loads of our friends to come and help put up this frame. Uh, and it was the most glorious weekend. We, we had, you know, we carried all the bits of wood down communally. Communally, uh, we had people that were great with knots and twining ropes together, we, winching things up from trees. Glorious, glorious, glorious times. The, just the spirit of everyone coming together, and bang, this job got done in two days flat. And, you know, everyone that's there that we loved, you know, and working together. We had this, and this huge Romanian guy, Lucian, and Lucian, as we called him, Luke, he was there. And at one point, there was this massive oak beam that none of us could quite get in. The ropes were at the end of their knots. And so Lucian was called, and he just, he had arms like my legs. <laughs> he was huge from the Carpathian Mountains. And he just stood there, and he lifted this beam up the room. And there it was, it was in. And so this just amazing communal effort. The rope system around all the trees. Just and, full of and love families, and laughter. Everybody bringing their families. Yeah, kids and we all were over all the place. Cooking these huge bacon joints. Into yeah, massive sandwiches at lunchtime. Yeah. Just two days of, yeah, love, basically. Just, and it got it up. There it was, it was standing at the end of it. I'd have to show you a film. We've got a little time lapse film. Oh, yes, please. Uh, yeah, well, we've also more than a time lapse as well. There's a time lapse, oh, yes. but there's also a, like a 14 minute film of, yeah, our friends. They ran a. Uh, Christo. Christo and Holly, they ran a uh, community cinema that's, that's run just by Love in Newcastle. Still there, the Star and Shadow Cinema in Newcastle. So it's a nice film as well. It's some glorious Americana music behind it and yeah just oh. captures the spirit yeah, the show, right? that was definitely a good moment oh, that was just the best moment really. it just it encapsulated what community can be about you mm -hmm. know? just that that giving when it's required you know just the joy of it as well brilliant we have been so dependent on our friends that we have, we used to live in Newcastle, so there's a lot of friends that still live in the city and are really happy to come and help and be part of it. And that was, yeah, that moment was quite special, yeah. It's interesting you say that you've been dependent on them because I would imagine hmm. they would get an awful lot from that experience themselves. Yeah, uh, yes, I hear they do. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yes, it's a, a, a precious relationships. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. it works both ways, yeah. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I, I'm constantly humbled by people saying that. You know, that recently I've wanted to, my sawmilling, I wanted to reinvest in the sawmill, but even though we're doing better these days, you know, a 20,000 pound investment in the sawmill is a really big thing. A bit of machinery, you know yourself, you just bought a big mixer, haven't you? It's, mm. it's quite a big decision. And I was unable to do it by myself. And I, I talked to a friend, we were just talking about five years, what are we going to do in the next five years? And it turned out that he said, you know, I don't go for finance because finance is quite harsh on the repayments. He said, I'll lend you it, you know. You've given me so much over the years. I've got spare money in the bank account. And so I managed to finance it just from these friends that have helped over the years. And they were saying that I'd help them as much as... and. Yeah, wow, that just feels beautiful. And so all the money for the sawmill has just been loaned, no interest again. And they're just so happy to do it because you know, this land, this place has fed them as well as them having fed us. They're giving, they're constantly humbling that. <laughs> Thank you, Joe and Matt. Uh, thank you, everyone at Abundant Earth. Uh, thank you, everyone who attends the Northern Bowl, uh, which is hosted up there on their land outside of Durham. It really is a special collection of people uh, that get together to create not just woodcraft, but music. I mean, really, it's community. 
Uh, it is a really special event. Uh, do you get along if you can? So there are links in the show notes, links to Joe and Matt's Instagram pages, to Abundant Earth. Uh, NVC was mentioned, Nonviolent Communication. There's a link to that. Check that out. It's a really great communication uh, sort of framework, I guess you call it. Co-ops UK. Um, I've put in a link to CUK, which is the Somatic Experiencing Association. Um, if you're interested in that, uh, links to Northern Bowl and to Woof, uh, <laughs> which is Willing Workers on Organic Farms. Uh, I didn't sort of, I sort of caught myself a little bit off guard there by how much I enjoyed <laughs> saying Woof. <laughs> um, if this is your first episode and you're still listening, uh, then please do subscribe and don't miss any future episodes. And check back through the uh, the previous 100 episodes. Um, if this was particularly your thing, then definitely check out episode two with Chris Vernon, all about the One Planet development in Wales. Um, so yes, you've got right to the end of the podcast, which means you are clearly part of the A-team. Uh, I'm buttering you up because I'm going to ask you to share this episode. Uh, it really helps so much to get more ears hearing these hopefully valuable conversations. Um, so thank you very much. Um, finally, finally, uh, is just to say if you find this podcast useful, entertaining or some other reason I can possibly understand, then do consider supporting via the patron uh, link in the show notes. Uh, your support helps me out so so much and you get loads more little nuggets of uh, of information from the guests as a thank you okay that is all from me thank you so much for your ears i hope you've enjoyed it as much as i have loved listening to it uh we'll be back soon with more joe and matt to talk about their strawberry house but until then see you bye <laughs>